Good morning. My name is Murray. I'm the pastors here in Grace Saskatoon. Glad to be here. Um, not only pastor Grace Saskatoon, but but dad of two of the music team and and a brother of of the other. So that works out really well. Well, we're we're working our way through the gospel according to Luke, and then after Easter, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. So that will be a great study for us. And then following that, in September 2025, we're going to uh, kick off our series in the book of Revelation. So that'll be starting next September. And then we're just going to keep working through books of the Bible until Jesus comes back. And there's always a lot of interest in end times. In fact, I've always been told that there's two ways to gather a big crowd. Uh, A is to talk about sex, and B is to talk about the end times. And so I started thinking, maybe we should talk about sex in the end times, you know? We'll see what, what, how that would go, right? But that's not exactly what Jesus is going to talk about here in Luke chapter 17 where we're on. He's actually going to talk, though, about the end of this present age because he wants us to know for certain that he is coming back. So here's our scripture passage. We're in Luke chapter 17, verses 20, right through to the end of the chapter in verse 37. Reading from Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 37. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look there, or look here, do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So Lord, just give us ears to hear exactly what you would have each one of us to personally hear from you in this passage. And So verse 20, we'll start unpacking this. Then it starts out being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. In the future, I will raise up my servants, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, who will write the Left Behind series and create a series of movies to answer all your questions. Is that what your version said? (laughs) Mine neither, right? No, here's what Jesus actually said. He said, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. And I go, what? No charts? No, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So who's standing right there in the midst of them? Jesus. There's the connection. If you miss Jesus, you actually miss the kingdom of God. It's like those nine Jewish lepers we looked at last week, right? They focused on their temporary, um, current life, right? They, They... like the blessing of being healed of their leprosy, but they didn't 
go forward to actually establish a relationship, an ongoing relationship with Jesus, who is the king of the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God, it's what the Old Testament scriptures all pointed to. It's a restoration of what was lost in the garden when the first humans, no, they didn't trust the word of God. They didn't trust his heart, their creator. And though he'd only shown them love and kindness and good, yet instead, what did they do? Rather than trusting the word of God, what did they trust? The word of a creature, a rebel angel. And the people believed lies about God, which led them to misinterpret reality, and they fell into sin, and then they joined the enemy of the kingdom of darkness in his rebellion against God. Yet God, in incomprehensible grace, all through the Old Testament scriptures, he promised a future glorious day when God's kingdom would actually be restored by this coming anointed, delivering king. And then the shalom, the peace, and the rest in the presence of God would be revived. But however, for the most part, the, the Jews, they actually saw themselves as victims, and they actually saw that their main problem was outside of themselves, right? They saw their great enemy as these political powers that oppressed them, you know, from the Assyrians on to the Babylonians and the Persians, uh, followed by the Greeks. And at Jesus' time, it was the Romans. And so they wanted a Messiah that would come and slay all the bad guys with a lightsaber. And then after the smackdown, he'd set up the kingdom for them, the good people. And we can understand that kind of thinking, right? Because we all have longing for rest and meaning where everything is just set right. There's no more suffering. It's just a time of fullness of rest and joy and peace. And that won't have any expiration date. And so Jesus tells them, what you really long, what you actually need is right in your midst right now. And they're standing right in front of them in the flesh was Jesus. But Jesus didn't impress them much. He didn't seem like anything significant. What they did not see was that our king first came in this humble posture because his intent wasn't to come at that moment to crush the Romans and all his enemies, but rather he actually came to be crushed in place of us. He actually came to seek and to save us from our true enemy, which is actually us and our sin, our blind and cold and rebellious, prideful hearts. And that's how he was going to bring in the kingdom. And people are being called into it to surrender, to, to wave the white flag, to change teams from being that of, of rebels to repenters in a relationship with this king who's just filled with compassion and mercy and grace. So, let's get the when, right? The when, well, eternal life in the kingdom of God does not begin when we die. It begins when we meet Jesus and gladly put our trust in him. That's the already portion of this kingdom, and yet there still is a not yet. See, the kingdom of God comes progressively. It starts with Jesus' first coming, his first advent, and then it will we'll experience it in its fullest expression in his second coming. So verse 22, Jesus now directs his focus to his disciples here, and he warns them not to get caught up with all these, looking for these signs, all these different speculations. So verse 22, and he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And so we get that, right? Because we all, I think, at different times, we have that desire and just longing for that full expression of the kingdom in the resurrection, but we haven't seen it yet. In verse 23, and they will say to you, look there, or look here, do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. See, people missed Jesus in his first coming, even though he was right in front of them. He was right in their midst, in their flesh, in, in his flesh, but they wouldn't miss recognizing him for who he really is in his second coming. See, every generation has false teachers 
has wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, suffering. And Jesus says, just don't get deceived. Because though I've brought in my kingdom, these troubles, they're going to continue in the world just as they have. And people will always be pointing to you to, to something or someone as the ultimate hope. I mean, politicians, right? They promise a new world order, right? To bring in the peace and stability and the justice and the utopia that we all desire. Or people will point you to some kind of technology or some advancement that's going to bring peace and prosperity on earth. And Jesus just says, don't believe them. He warns that false teachers will abound and they'll try to point you to all kinds of signs in the here or there. But Jesus says his day, When he comes to fully set up the kingdom, it will be sudden, it will be unmistakable, and it will be inescapable. It's like lightning lighting up the whole sky. You won't miss it. In fact, it will come when it comes. It'll be so sudden that no chart or diagram can prepare you for it. And by the time you observe and go, oh, this is it, it will be over. In the twinkling of an eye, in the brilliance and glory of the second coming of the Son of God. So Jesus says there's actually one key question you really need to make sure you know the answer to. That's before he identifies himself as the Son of Man, sets up the kingdom in all its fullness, before he judges and sets things right, the question you need to focus on isn't the when, but it's the who. Who is the center of this glorious kingdom and who can bring you into this kingdom. See, in the Bible, really, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. And Jesus makes it plain. He is going to establish a glorious kingdom. Verse 25, but first. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. See, this was the mystery that everyone tripped over in Jesus' day because before he could set up the kingdom, Jesus had to die. In order to bring the peace of God on earth, he had to actually make peace between us and God. And that could only happen through his death. The same son of man who's gonna come in judgment, he will first be judged. In his death, It's almost like he took and looked ahead and saw the final judgment that was to come, uh, and he, he sort of pulled it over into this age, and it all funneled down onto himself for everyone who would ever believe. And then he'd create in us this new heart to know and love him. See, the religious leaders, like many, they don't recognize that the problems in the world actually begin in our own hearts. And so before God could calm the storms of chaos and destruction on earth, he had to calm the storms of chaos and rebellion in our hearts. And so apart from Jesus stepping into our place and receiving what we should have received for our sin, no one could justly be considered worthy to enter into the glorious kingdom. That kingdom where there's no more Satan, no sin, no death, no sorrow, no more war, No more injustice, where no one goes hungry, soldiers will be out of a job, we don't need locks on our doors, don't need airbags in our cars, we don't need walkers or wheelchairs. Praise God for all those things that make life bearable now, but there is a day coming when all those things will no longer be needed, and all the sin and all the effects of sin and the works of our enemy are going to be removed forever for those who love Jesus and are surrendered to his authority. And this is why Jesus says, this is a kingdom to be longed for, to be desired, right? I long for the Son of Man to come and make things right, to make me right, to actually wipe away all tears from our faces, to turn our mourning into joyful dancing. And in the kingdom, Jesus is in charge. And that is wonderful. I vote to never have to vote again. Like, give me a king whose name is Jesus. And he can just take it from here, and then we'll all be happy. Right now, you're not going to find Jesus' name on any election ballot. Unless maybe you're in Latin America. Maybe you might there, but, but you can receive Jesus as your king right now. 
That's the whole point of Jesus standing there in their midst and they're saying, when, when bring this kingdom? Well, you can have this kingdom right now by bowing and surrendering to this king. And then the kingdom will begin in your heart. And that's why Jesus makes sure that we know that before the kingdom can come, he must first make atonement for his people. Because those who would skip over the cross and just go to the kingdom, right? Let's just get along. Let's just help people and, and do nice things and we'll have this better world. But there is no way to this kingdom but by way of the cross. So for now, we wait. It's been 2,000 years so far, but we've got a mission and a purpose while we wait, right? We're not just like toddlers in the back seat, right? Are we there yet? How much further are we there yet? No, we get to join Jesus and actually partner with him in inviting others to Jesus and into his kingdom so they don't miss out. So there is a delay in Jesus' return because in his mercy, Jesus is giving people an opportunity to repent, to surrender to him as Lord, that they can enter into the kingdom, which is all about a relationship with this king. But the day is coming when Jesus will come back And then it will happen quickly, suddenly like lightning, and tragically, many will not be prepared. And Jesus gives two examples from the Old Testament scriptures, starting in verse 26. He says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. The days of Noah then were this foreshadowing of what is going to happen again at the end of the age and the coming of this renewed world. I mean, I can picture every day Noah would have to, you know, really as an act of faith, sit down, have his breakfast, right? And do you think there was ever a day maybe when Noah looked over at his wife and said, I really just don't feel like working again on that boat today, right? It's getting really expensive and it's it's a lot of work, right? And people come and make fun of me. Besides, we... We live in the desert, right? So even if it did start raining, whatever rain is, right? It seems like it would take a lot of rain to lift this battleship. Because we're talking, this was a boat of 1.4 million cubic feet. That would be 522 rail cars. So I imagine he got tired. And it would take faith for him to get up each day, faith in God's word, faith in God's heart, faith in God's promise to endure and to press on forward. And then through Noah, God warned the people that a judgment flood was coming. But people, we can see what they were doing. They were just preoccupied with their jobs, their families, getting married, taking vacations, pursuing hobbies, uh, planning for their retirement. They were eating and drinking and partying and having a good time, just basically carrying on life as as they know it. And none of those things are bad things, but if they're not resting on the most important thing, Right? So what happened is they were not willing to lose that life they had and exchange it for life on the boat because they weren't sure where life on the boat would get them. But what strikes me really is just how normal and ordinary life was and was for these people when the judgment came. And sadly, many people are going to miss the kingdom of God in a renewed world, some are going to just outright reject the invitation to come to Jesus. Others, they're just going to neglect to respond because their lives are busy, they're entertaining themselves, they're neglecting the reality of their need of a savior. And so they just neglect to do anything about it. And then thirdly, some are going to actually profess to believe. And they may even follow for a time. But ultimately, they will not persevere in the faith. They will not keep on believing and trusting in God's word. So Jesus draws our attention to remember the days of Noah. And now there's another person Jesus wants us to remember. Remember Lot's wife, he's going to say. In verse 28, he says, Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, They were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. In other words, doing their own thing, living life. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. 
In fact, if you want to read the whole story about Lot and his wife uh, more in more detail, you can find it in Genesis chapter 19. And there was this area where there's two main cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe you've heard of them. The citizens there were filled with pride and rebellion. It was all about self and self-defined identity. They had particular were involved in sexual sin of, of all sorts. They probably called it tolerance and diversity and had a parade. But God, with tears, called it prideful, arrogance, exalting of self, and he called it an abomination. Even Lot's sons-in-law, they thought the whole idea of sin and God's judgment was just laughable. Angels came as messengers to tell them, you need to get out of here and do not look back because judgment is coming upon this city. Verse 31, on that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away because your stuff is not going to be of any help to you in that day. And likewise, let the one who's in the field not turn back. In other words, this is urgent. You need to get yourself to a place of safety now in preparation for the judgment to come. And the only place of safety is Jesus. Coming to Jesus should take priority over everything else. And then remember Lot's wife. See, Jesus' big warning is not Beware of taking the mark of the beast. That's not his warning. His warning is, remember Lot's wife. And who's he giving this warning to? Who's he, who's he giving this reminder to? Who's he talking to? His disciples. He's talking to those who actually profess and claim to be his disciples. I mean, that's you and me right here in this theater. Lot's wife was physically taken out of Sodom, but Sodom was still in her heart, and it led to her destruction. Her feet were running away from Sodom, but her heart was actually staying in Sodom. She knew the truth, but what she really loved and treasured in her heart was the treasures of Sodom. She looked back because of what she actually loved, what she valued, and she perished. We could say she wouldn't let go of the ring. That's a Lord of the Rings reference, right? Lot's wife was part of a believing family. She was part of Abraham's family, right? But she valued what she was going to miss in the city of destruction more than what was to be gained in the city of God. She knew the truth. In fact, she would recite, oh yes, God loves me. But she didn't value God. So being loved by him really wasn't such a big deal. It's kind of like the two brothers in Luke 15 we, we looked at a few weeks ago. They undervalued the treasure and value they had in the love of their father. So it didn't actually move their heart, right? Or maybe it'd be like when back when you were in junior high, right? And you, you heard that this other person had this crush on you. How'd that make you feel? Well, it all depends who it was. It all depends who it was. If you thought it was that uncool person that nobody liked, and you heard that, it wouldn't move you. But if somebody you valued, someone who you adored and was really looked up to, and then you heard they had a crush on you? See, we want to be adored by someone we adore and treasure, someone we see as most valuable. And the Lord Jesus holds up Lot's wife as a beacon, as a warning. And all his warnings are for our good. And he says, what three words? Remember Lot's wife. Second shortest verse in the Bible, right? Jesus wept in John 11, and here three words, remember Lot's wife. He doesn't bid us to remember Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Sarah or Hannah or Ruth. No, he actually singles out one whose soul was lost forever. 
And he cries to us, remember Lot's wife. So memorize that verse. It's only three words. Memorize it. Call it to mind when you are tempted to not seek first the kingdom of heaven. When you're tempted to not let go of the ring, remember Lot's wife. We've been rescued in and through Jesus. In him is the greatest treasure. There's just no need to look back because everything your heart truly longs for is actually found in a relationship with Jesus. And when the Son of Man returns, it says it's going to be like a rerun of the days of Noah and a rerun of the days of Lot in Sodom. Because Jesus' kingdom is not just some ethereal, spiritual, vague, disembodied experience. And it's certainly not something substandard or lower to anything in life here now. It's a resurrection. The resurrected Jesus has a new glorified body. And he eats fish. And he's got a physical body that can be touched. Jesus' resurrection kingdom, that's creation at its fullest. That's what the miracle showed us. It's what his resurrected body shows us. It's about redeeming this world where people become more alive, not less alive. Whatever you miss out on this present age is insignificant because the eternal kingdom, that brings in the better reality. And that's why bucket lists don't make a lot of sense for Christians. Some of you are really depressed because you're still single. And you're like, don't want Jesus to return yet. Because if Jesus returns, I'll never get to experience marriage. Or maybe you're in a bad marriage. And you say, if Jesus returns, then I'll never get to know what it is like to be truly loved. Well, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7, starting verse 29. He says, basically in this little section, he says, no, no, let him with a wife be like someone without one, and the one who doesn't have a wife be like the one who does. Now, his point is not to live like you have a hall pass. That's not what he's saying. But he says, but that we actually live in this world differently. We're not holding on tightly. We're not hanging on to, to anything because this present world is passing away. And what you're going to get in eternity far surpasses marriage and any other experience in this present time. Marriage and every other good thing is just a dim symbol. It's a foreshadowing, just a foretaste of the eternal thing that far surpasses it in glory and joy and fulfillment. So don't say, wow, I only had one childhood and my parents screwed it up. You have an eternal childhood coming with your heavenly father that cannot be compared to anything here. In the kingdom of Jesus, in the coming resurrection, there is no loss. It's only great gain. It's going to be better in every way. So instead of a bucket list of imperfect things and having that as your obsession, how about making God's kingdom your obsession now and entering its fullness when Jesus comes again. Because Jesus' kingdom is going to give you the marriage feast of the Lamb. It's got real food, real wine. It's going to make the best tasting food here taste like that old canned gelled ham used to get with the key. No, this is going to be the feast of all feasts. And you're going to be held by real arms. And we don't even really know how to describe it. John gives his best attempt of it in the book of Revelation, and it sounds incredible. All the books of the New Testament scriptures focus so much on the second coming because it's designed to be a motivation for our trust and our obedience. And when Paul talks about pain in your life in the here and now, he says in Romans 8, he says, just to see those like labor pains, this Pain will produce and birth a greater joy in the coming kingdom than would have been possible without that pain. Anything here, good or bad, is nothing compared to eternity in and with Jesus' kingdom. 
The magic kingdom of a mouse has nothing on the resurrection kingdom of God. In contrast to Lot's wife, whose heart was set on things here in this life, her life in Sodom, Jesus says this in verse 33, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. Will lose real life, eternal life, and real happiness, like Lot's wife did. But whoever loses his life will keep it. So if we hang on trying to be our own Lord, we will lose everything. If we die to self as Lord, and we live submitting our will to Jesus as Lord, then everything is gain and the future is bright. Losing your life here, though, is going to be all about patience. And the scripture continually calls us to this life of patience. Patience means delayed gratification. Not something we hear a lot about nowadays in our culture. Patience is delayed gratification. It means walking faithfully even when you don't feel or see the outcome. And this is where a lot of us falter because we want to see and experience the blessing right now, right? I did what you asked, God, where's my blessing, right? I, I started giving and no rich uncle that I don't know yet has given me a million dollars. If you're going to follow Jesus, there is so much that's going to be hard and unfulfilled and unrewarded until the fullness of the coming kingdom. The less real his coming is to you, the more obsessed you're going to be with the here and now. When you don't treasure and live in light of Jesus' second coming, then the more easily you're going to succumb to temptations, the more you're going to engage in materialism, the more you're going to be focused on, on your, your suffering and what you don't have. So the imminent expectation of the return of Jesus is necessary for living as a disciple. Verse 34, he says, I tell you, in that night there will be two in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together, one will be taken and the other left. And two will be at the theater or the church gathering, and one will be taken and the other left. Jesus is telling us he could occur, his return could occur right in the middle of anything. While you're in bed, while you're at work, at any time. And verse 37, and they said to him, where, Lord? Now, honestly, I'm not even sure what they're asking, right? I mean, are they asking where are they being taken to? The ones being taken, is that what they're getting at? Well, Jesus said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So whatever they exactly meant, Jesus' answer is very gruesome, and a sobering picture, vultures gathering together to feast on corpses, right? A corpse is a dead, lifeless body. And vultures are birds that, that eat dead things. So there is no lasting life apart from Jesus. Now, I don't think the point is trying to figure out whether it's good to be taken or left, which you want to be. The point is there is a separation some are delivered, and some are received into the wonder and goodness and joy of the kingdom, and others will perish. So let's anticipate his coming. It's such good news. All the troubles in this world, for those who are united to Jesus, it's just a light and momentary affliction in light of the eternal weight of glory that awaits us when everything is made new and all the wrongs set right. In the very last words of the Bible, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. And the Bible writer John says, come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. So praise God for the grace of Jesus, who got off his throne, he disrobed, and the sword of his own justice that could not be denied fell upon him. He died the accursed death of a rebel in God's kingdom. He died the death of a traitor so that a traitor and rebel like me could be left standing in the day of judgment and be received as a son, seated at the royal table, 
treated as a faithful, loyal son. Me. Me, the, the, the wonder of it all. The end is coming. Jesus is returning. And until then, let's just draw near to the king today who has in his incarnation and his suffering and death and resurrection, he's inaugurated his kingdom and we're invited into it. And while we await his return and we await the fullest expression of his kingdom, let us not let our love grow cold. Let's not get off course. Let's not lose our focus from centering on Jesus and communing with him and walking in the spirit in obedience to our king and aiming our life to walk in partnership with him and one another on his mission of gathering in a people from all the nations because that's why we're here. And we're here in this gathering just to renew our affections for him, to renew our focus once again of our purpose. So let's enjoy Jesus even now in this present age for our king who was and is and is yet to come. Let's pray. Lord, would you just help us, help us to remember Lot's wife. Anytime we're tempted to not persevere in trusting you and following you, would you stir our hearts to live for your kingdom now, living on your mission? Would you stir our hearts to, to keep the, the coming fullness of the kingdom that you're going to bring at your second coming ever before us so that we might live in light of that, which is eternal and that we might live with anticipation of the renewal of all things. Jesus, you've certainly chosen an ugly woman to be your bride, but you love us. And When you return, when you're done with us, we're going to reflect your beauty without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and that's because of you, your blood has washed us clean. We'll be holy and without blemish before you in that coming day. Wow. We have no reason to ever look back. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray. Amen.